True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. When handsome, wealthy investment banker Ted Amon missed a Monday morning business meeting and then failed to pick up his children from school, friends were concerned. Ted was nothing if not reliable. He'd spent the weekend at his East Hampton home, so his business partner took a helicopter ride to his estate to see what Ted was up to. Ted had really stood out as an athletic guy who loved his kids and his three dogs. But Ted had been going through a lengthy, nasty divorce and child custody battle. His wife was universally believed to be a difficult woman, and she'd been dating a man with a criminal history. Join us at the quiet end today for In His Own Home, the Ted Amon story. This story really shows us how even the most perfect looking among us has struggles and even unexpected dangers in their lives. So today's beer is from Queens, New York. It's called Finback IPA from Finback Brewery. It's a New England IPA. This is one of the the neater looking beers. It looks like a creamsicle Mm. when you pour it. It's got that light orange color. Big, huge white head, a ton of lace. It's a, a beautiful looking beer. Nice aroma of fruit. And there's some floral and herbal hops mixed in there. Mostly melon taste, a little bit of pine and a good background of caramel. This is a medium-bodied beer, very easy to drink, very nice beer. I'm sure the quiet end is going to like this one. Sounds lovely. Let's open it up and have a look. Okay. All right, let's take these creamsicles down to the quiet end. Okay, it is quiet again today. I know it was busy over the weekend. Everyone was here watching Super Bowl. Well, we kind of need it quiet to do the show. Super Bowl would not work with True Crime Brewery, I'm afraid. No, and there's hardly anybody here. Although, hey, you guys back there, can you be quiet, please? All right, thank you. Oh, you're being the grumpy old man. Well, we're trying to get this thing going. All right, well, why don't you start it then? Okay. Robert Theodore Ammon was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to steel executive Bob Ammon and his wife Betty Lee. He was the first son. He was born two years after his big sister, Sandy. His parents called him Teddy, and then as he got older, Ted. The Ammon family had that idyllic 1950s upper-middle-class lifestyle. Betty Lee stayed home with Sandy and Teddy. Now, Betty Lee was an intelligent, strong woman who encouraged her children to be competitive and to work hard in school. Now, school turned out to be pretty easy for Ted. He was a pretty bright guy, but he also had a photographic memory. So studying was very easy for him. When he was in the eighth grade, his father was transferred to East Aurora, New York, to be in charge of a steel plant. Yeah, so this was the ideal family. This is how I picture your childhood. The Amons had their family dinner every night, followed by homework, and they'd go to their various sporting events. Bob Amon was Ted's Little League baseball coach, too. Ted was also on the swimming team. And he grew up to be very athletic, reaching an adult height of six foot four, so very tall. In high school, of course, Ted was on the football team. But he was different than a lot of the jocks because he played the piano quite well, and he got excellent grades. He did have several girlfriends throughout his teen years, being both a jock and an academic. He was widely popular. Sandy, his sister, would say that she and Ted had wonderful childhoods. And as adults, they did remain close. Yeah, I'll bet he did pretty well in high school. Here he is, an athlete and a bright guy. Yeah, he had a lot going for him. But he had a lot of girlfriends. Well, I don't know about a lot of. He had several. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Is a lot more than several? Or is several more than a lot? A lot is more than several. Several is like a handful. A lot is dozens. Oh, okay. That's the way it is in my brain. I think you're embellishing a little bit, but that's okay. That's just how I see it. Subjective. Now, the the other half of this equation that we'll be talking about is Generosa Rand. Her upbringing was far more complicated than Ted's. 
Generosa's mother, Marie, was born to a California farmer and his wife. Marie was a cute, moody little girl. She did actually join a convent for a year and then decided it wasn't working for her. So during World War II, Marie was uh, pretty much a party girl. She went out dancing and drinking, sometimes flighty, sometimes a slug. Some family members were worried that she might be suffering from some mental illness like manic depression. But Marie had no desire to seek mental health help. Marie's father died just a few years before her mother died of cancer, and that left Marie dependent on her older brother. So Marie married a soldier. They had two children, but she was a negligent mother, and her children were taken from her, and she got divorced. She then married Clarence Rand, who was another soldier, and this was a few years later. Right, so Marie and Clarence had a daughter named Dolly, but Marie went back to partying while Dolly was still a toddler. So Dolly was left with family members while Marie would drink and dance and meet new men. She met an Italian man named Generoso and had a short-lived affair with him in her Long Beach apartment. And after about a week of hooking up, Generoso was out of Marie's life, went back to Italy. But then she found out that she was pregnant, and it wasn't by her husband. So Marie wrote to Generoso and told him about her pregnancy, but he never responded. So her fourth child, who she did give her husband's last name, was named Generosa after her father. But Marie didn't take long to return to her partying ways. Family members didn't call Generosa by her given name either, because a lot of them knew that this child had been named after this Italian guy. They called her Jen or Joe. She became very close with her older sister, Dolly, after Marie began to leave the two home alone to go out and have fun again. So Generosa was four and Dolly was seven when they moved to Oceanside, California with their mother. Their uncle Al was also divorced by then. He lived in a ground floor apartment in a three-family house that he had purchased. There were tenants on the third floor and Marie and her two daughters were allowed to live on the second floor without paying rent. So Marie even hired an English housekeeper who acted as a babysitter for her two girls. And the housekeeper was kind to the girls. As time went on, they really began to prefer the housekeeper to their own mother. But things didn't go well. The childhood just continued to be problematic. Little Generosa was sexually molested as a child by a man who her mother had trusted as a family friend. And then the English housekeeper was fired by her uncle Al for having men to the house. So quite a mess. It sure is. And it gets messier. Two years after all this, Marie felt a lump in her breast. Within a couple of years, she had metastatic breast cancer, which had reached her brain. And Marie died when Generosa was just 10 years old. So she and Dolly, her older sister, went to live with her Uncle Al. In the meantime, he had remarried, and he lived in an exclusive Laguna Beach neighborhood. Dolly showed Generosa a photo of her biologic father, who was a sailor named Generoso. Now, this was the first time Generosa knew that her mother had not been married to her father, and she resented her mother for lying to her and for failing to protect her. Well, sure. But they said that from that time forward, Generosa was a different girl. She was determined to be strong and to be rich. She didn't ever want to have children of her own either. She decided that her mother's death had been a good thing, and now she was free to live a better life. Uncle Al's new wife, Aunt Marge, was a smart and financially well-off woman. Generosa admired her and ended up having kind of a special friendship with her. Marge said that she wanted Generosa to live with them, but the house was really full and there was a lot of friction between Generosa and her cousins. Generosa was prone to temper tantrums, and she could be very jealous, devious, and manipulative. You know, in her mind, it was her way or no way. And Dolly had been a a fairly troubled teen also, maybe not to the extent that Generosa was. But eventually Dolly was sent to live with her older half-sister Terry, Terry's husband and their two kids, in Santa Clara, California. And Aunt Marge had a rich friend who lived in Laguna Beach with her husband and their two children. These folks had an eight-bedroom house on a horse ranch, So Jane, the woman who was living in the house, offered to adopt Generosa, and Generosa moved in with Jane and the family. She became very good at horse riding. 
more than good, actually. She competed in shows, and she even won ribbons. She also began to do well in school. So it seems like she's coming out of her funk a little bit, huh? She seemed to really thrive there. Yeah. She learned to play the piano. She got braces to fix her teeth. And she seemed to have things going pretty well. She had money. She had loving parents, foster parents, step-parents, whatever, and an estate with her own horse. Right. So you'd think everything was great, and she could be quite charming. But she was continuing to have a frightening temper. Big tantrums, too, whenever anything wasn't going her way. And as Generosa entered late adolescence, she had really changed from this sweet girl to a really rebellious troublemaker. In 1967, Jane called Generosa's half-sister Terry and told her that Generosa was causing trouble with the other kids. Generosa was demanding, jealous, and she just seemed like she could never have enough material possessions. Jane and her husband couldn't control her. They were really tired and kind of desperate to be relieved of her. Terry was well aware of how it felt to be abandoned. She'd had a similar childhood, and she felt sympathy for her little sister, so she agreed to take her in. And remember, Terry was already parenting Dolly. Her husband was a high school English teacher who was very patient and good with the kids. Terry and her husband had two kids of their own, two daughters, Julie and Amy. And their house was pretty comfortable. They had four bedrooms and two baths, but it wasn't anything like the estate that Generosa was coming from, and it wasn't good enough for her. She was really unhappy about being there and became angry and very resentful. She no longer lived on the estate, and she had to leave her horse behind, and that really pissed her off. Life wasn't fair to her, she said, and she was just kind of angry at the whole world. When Dolly was 18, she got her own apartment in San Jose. She moved out of the house that Terry and her husband had. Dolly soon became promiscuous and got herself into drugs. Terry had also been sexually abused as a child, and when Dolly moved out, Terry became very depressed. And as she sunk deeper and deeper into depression, she and Generosa butted heads. It almost seemed like Generosa knew that Terry had some weaknesses and was using them against her. And then Terry's husband began to see Generosa as a bad influence on their younger daughters. They saw her getting away with things, and they themselves got into a bit of trouble. Right, so this was just difficult, and it ended up being really heartbreaking for Terry, who had only wanted to help her sisters. But she and her husband finally had to decide that they just couldn't handle Generosa. And Terry wasn't feeling well. The house was just kind of getting out of control. They told Generosa that the situation wasn't working, finally, and she was given one month's notice to find a new place to live. Generosa cried, but Terry promised that they would continue to help her however they could. And Generosa finally said she understood. But you know, this was her fourth big rejection. She'd been abandoned by her mother, her uncle, Jane Reagan, who owned the estate, and now Terry and her husband. So she was sad, but you know, really building this deep-seated anger. So Generosa ended up living with another family who were friends with her aunt. And this family had two teenage daughters of their own, and they lived in Los Angeles. So things are okay at this house for a while. The family found Generosa to be very creative and pretty talented artistically. But she was moody as hell. She was expelled from the Catholic schools. She was told to straighten up or leave. So Generosa figured out that she was running out of options. And she actually changed her attitude and her behavior. She played tennis and continued with her artwork. Yes, yeah, so it was one year later when Generosa learned that her sister Dolly had been killed in a car accident. And of course, she was devastated. She stayed with that family in L.A. for four years until she graduated from high school. And then she began her freshman year at the University of California at Irvine. Her uncle Al legally adopted her and paid her expenses. She graduated in 1981 and moved to Manhattan to start a career in the art world. Once there, though, she just cut herself off from everyone like she wanted nothing to do with her past. And Terry wrote her letter after letter, but Generosa returned them unopened and even wrote a note saying she didn't want anything to do with any of them. So she cut all ties with family back home. Yeah, at least for a while. She did talk to some people later, but 
Yeah, she just decided she was starting over, a new yeah. life in New York. That's it. Now, after he graduated high school, Ted Ammon went to Bucknell University in central Pennsylvania. He played lacrosse, pledged a fraternity. He changed majors more than once and finally decided on a double major in art and economics. He signed up with the Air Force to become a pilot, but had to drop out because he failed an eye exam. Yeah, so after he finished college, Ted followed a girlfriend out to San Francisco. Her dad was an executive for a big department store, and he actually gave Ted a job in shipping and receiving. After several months of that, Ted applied to a training program for international banking, and he learned about international finance and fell in love with a fellow trainee named Randy Day. Randy was a petite athletic blonde. She was a year older than Ted. They both completed the program, and Randy got a job in England. So Ted followed her, and they shared an apartment in London. And they ended up getting married in 1974. Once in London, Ted made this decision that he wanted to be a lawyer. Of course, he hadn't gone to law school, but he hired himself a tutor and was able to pass the English law test without ever going to law school. So that's quite amazing. Certainly is. So after that, he got a position with a British law firm specializing in maritime law. But Randy was soon transferred to New York, and Ted returned with her to the U.S. Back there, he studied and passed the bar exam on the first try. Ted and Randy spent the holidays with his family, and his older sister, Sandy, she'd married a doctor from Alabama. His name was Bob Williams. So these two couples got along great, and they played board games together. And Ted's favorite was Monopoly. He was very competitive with it. <laughs> so Ted and Randy both worked very long hours and were financially successful. But over the years, they were really just spending too little time together, and they grew apart. So they ended up getting divorced in 1983, but they remained friendly. Now, when Ted got divorced, Jenna Rosa was working as an artist in New York. She was a painter, sculptor, and photographer. She had some talent, but really never managed to get any of her work shown. Well, you know what's interesting is a lot of people had said that her art never had people in it, and it was kind of awful because it was just so desolate. Her sculptures and paintings and photography was mostly of buildings and, like, hard things, not nature or human beings or animals. So I just find that kind of interesting. That is. Now, in order to pay her bills, Jenna Rosa worked for a real estate firm selling and renting high-end properties. And she reinvented herself as a wealthy trust fund brat from the West Coast. And she acted as if she only worked for the fun of it. Now, Ted was looking for a New York apartment since he was single again. And he made an appointment and ended up uh, having Generosa showing him an advertised property. On the day of his appointment, though, he got busy at work and he missed the showing. The very next day, Generosa called and angrily told him off for blowing off the showing. She said that she had waited for him and he had wasted her valuable time. Yes, yeah, so I guess Ted felt a little bit guilty but also he found the agent's tough response kind of intriguing. He apologized and set up another showing and promised that he would be there. And when he met her, he was attracted to her. She was smart, tough, and pretty sexy. He asked her out for coffee and they began dating. Ted really appreciated her artistic talent and her blatant ambition because, you know, she really wanted someone with money and she wasn't afraid to admit that. And within one month, they'd moved in together. So it went really quickly. It sure did. And then within a year, Generosa gave Ted an ultimatum. Either they get married or they break up. And Ted said he really wasn't ready to get married again, and he broke up with her. So she was pretty hurt and angry. Well, that play didn't work, did it? No. She called his family to complain that Ted had led her on and dumped her. But months later, Ted bumped into Generosa at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and they began seeing one another again. And this time, Generosa insisted on an engagement ring right away, or she wouldn't even get back together with him. And Ted must have really loved her because he agreed to that. Yeah, so they were married in 1986. They became a power couple and lived in a townhouse off Fifth Avenue. Early in the relationship, Ted found Generosa's sarcastic, tough attitude amusing. 
Despite her upscale lifestyle, she insisted that she wasn't a shallow, rich wife. She saw herself as an artist. She entertained at the townhouse often, but she went through friends quickly, as she had a habit of getting into arguments and throwing people out of her home. So we're continuing or, or reverting back to the my way or no way with Generosa. Well, I don't think it ever changed from that. I think it was that all along, but well, in she, the beginning, Ted thought it was kind of charming. She uh, submersed it for a while. Yeah, maybe. But not an easy woman. I mean, even her close family members would say that. And as Ted's income climbed, Generosa threw herself into remodeling their townhouse. When that was finished, she found a summer home in Bedford, gutted that, and hired contractors to make it just the way she wanted it. Money was no object, and she spent months decorating it. So that was kind of her full-time job. She wasn't really doing art very much. Right. She boarded horses at the summer house and entertained a lot of guests. She was a competitive jumper in horse shows all along the East Coast. And throughout the rest of the 1980s, Ted had leveraged several big business takeovers. This included a $2.5 billion deal for Storer Communications, a Florida broadcasting and cable TV group. He was also involved in the $1.25 billion deal to take over World Color Press. Ted was really seen as creative and as a good problem solver in business. His biggest transaction was for $25 billion. This was a takeover of RJR Nabisco in 1988. So, so Ted is becoming an extremely wealthy person. Yes, he is. And while he continued to grow his career, Generoso was busy running the house and planning social events. She also continued with her horse riding and her photography. Ted bought her a big loft in Soho for her to use as an art studio. He was really proud of her artistic ability. Now, Generosa had tried to get pregnant, but had not been successful. She herself never really wanted kids, but Ted did. And she felt terrible that she wasn't able to have a baby. So after uh, over a year of fertility treatments, they decided to adopt. To friends, Generosa claimed that she had decided not to get pregnant because it would interfere with her horse riding. Yeah, so Ted and Generosa flew to Ukraine on several occasions, and they ended up adopting a set of Ukrainian twins, a boy and a girl. These kids had been placed in a state orphanage by their mother who just couldn't afford to take care of them. So by this time, the almonds are worth over $50 million, so they've got their choice of whatever kid they want which is kind of sad to say, like their property, but it's true. And they liked these twins mostly because the little girl looked like Generosa had when she was a little girl. But, you know, of course, they're cute kids. The boy's name was Grego, and the girl was Alexa. The almonds brought them home in the spring of 1992. And that Easter, they took them to meet their Aunt Sandy and Uncle Bob, and they participated in their first Easter egg hunt. And for a while, the children became Generosa's focus. She hired a nanny, and she hired more housekeeping and cooking staff. The kids were very well behaved and really loved these new lives. They were enrolled in the best private schools in Manhattan. Then Ted started his own company, a printing business, which he named Big Flower Press, and his income just continued to increase. He was in on the ground floor of the internet and telecommunications boom, So his stocks really took off. So these are pretty good times for the Ammons. Kids were happy. They had fun trips, went on adventures. They built a dream house in the Hamptons, which Generosa helped design and decorate. She hired a young architect and paid him more than his firm would ever pay him over a several-year period. This was a small house, only 6,000 square feet, which Generosa wanted to look like an English country estate. The children had their own wing. Ted had his own wine cellar. Generosa insisted on a secure, secret, safe room where the family could hide if the home was ever invaded. Right, so like a panic room. That's pretty intriguing. I mean, it shows a little paranoia, I guess, too. (laughs) Yes. But I kind of like the idea. The home project in the Hamptons seemed to really bring out the worst in Generosa, though. She had this daily battle with her architect and her contractors. When the project was finally completed... She insisted that the architect not tell anyone that he had designed the house, and she told everyone that she had designed the house on her own. Then she also refused to pay the full amount to contractors, claiming they were trying to rip her off. 
So this was pretty embarrassing for Ted and really anybody around her. Her behavior was kind of despicable. But Ted always supported his wife in her conflicts, even when he didn't agree with her. And she seemed to be getting meaner as they got wealthier. The money wasn't making her happier, that was for sure. Former friends would have nothing to do with them because of Generosa's behavior. Her confidence had really turned into this strange bullying behavior, and her sense of humor had devolved into just plain old cruel sarcasm. Just a joy to be around. She sounds horrible. So, not surprisingly, Ted and Generosa's relationship began to suffer. How could it not? Ted was a health nut and very opposed to smoking, and Generosa began smoking more and more, sneaking outside to hide it from him. The only thing that seemed to make her happy was tearing down and rebuilding things, redoing and redesigning the house and the apartment in the city. But every time a project was complete, her mood worsened and she fell into an angry depression. So Ted suggested therapy. Generosa refused. She was incapable of trusting anyone, and she had cut herself off from everyone in her past. She began having temper tantrums in public, and he was even having outbursts with the kids. When she managed to make a friend, she would inevitably cut them off for some perceived slight against her. Yeah, so in 1996, Generosa was really branching out and trying to control Ted's business as well as their personal lives. Ted called his sister Sandy and told her that he was thinking of leaving Generosa. He described his wife as a manic-depressive personality who was just driving him crazy. There was no pleasing her, and she wasn't willing to change. But Generosa also called Sandy, and she complained that Ted was becoming very distant and cold. She felt like she had been the perfect wife, and he just didn't appreciate her. Also, she was becoming very jealous of any interactions that Ted had with other women. And that might have been reasonable. I wouldn't be surprised if he had seen some women. Because of the state of his marriage. State of his marriage, and he liked women. And he was he was out there, attractive, busy. They were apart. You know, he's traveling. Yeah. I just wouldn't be surprised. It could be. In 1998, Ted told a friend that Generosa was out of her mind. She was threatening him in moments of anger. She threatened to hire a hitman to kill him. Now, he didn't want to put the children through a divorce, but the marriage wasn't working. And it turned out that he was going overseas on business trips more and more, just in order to avoid confronting Generosa. Right. But finally, she did agree to some marriage counseling, and for a short time, things improved. They decided that a change of environment might help the marriage, so the couple took a trip to London, where Ted interviewed for an international banking job. They made a down payment on a 10,000-square-foot manor house in Surrey. This had 10 bedrooms, an art studio, tennis courts, stables, and a big greenhouse. But then Ted didn't accept the job there, even though they had the house. Generosa believed that leaving New York was the solution to their problems. But Ted decided he didn't want to move to England. He wanted to keep working in New York. But in the end, he did agree to move. And for about three months, the family was pretty happy there. Ted was with them most of the time, but he flew to the U.S. for work. Still, this wasn't good enough for Generosa. She wanted him with her in England with the children all of the time, and she thought, you know, you have plenty of money, why not retire? Yeah, why, indeed. Huh. Well, Ted preferred to be in New York, and it turned out he was secretly seeing a woman named Mary Belcap. One day in Surrey, Generosa looked through Ted's desk drawers and found out that he had bought a new apartment on Fifth Avenue and he had hired a London divorce attorney. She was shocked. She had absolutely no idea that he had been seeing another woman. So she confronted Ted, and he admitted to seeing an attorney, but he said that he had decided against a divorce. Generosa didn't believe him. She consulted an attorney herself and learned that a divorce and custody determination would turn out better for her if she was in New York. So before Ted could file for divorce, Generosa flew back to New York and filed preemptively. Right, so by this time, their townhouse and their Soho properties had been sold, and Ted agreed to buy an Upper East Side townhouse for Generosa to renovate. And as these renovations were being done, she and the kids moved into the Stanhope Hotel, which is a very nice hotel across from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. That's the so high-rent district. And they're living there. Yeah. The separation was mostly civil at this point, Ted had become resigned to giving Generosa a very generous settlement just to avoid any problems. 
He felt like he had plenty of money and he wanted the kids to have everything they needed. But unknown to Ted, Generosa had hired a private detective and she had found out about his mistress. So after that, she began to be very controlling about the terms of when Ted could see the children. She often changed plans at the last minute, which would result in less time or not even seeing their father. Then she also found her own new relationship, and that was with a guy named Daniel Pelosi. He was an electrical contractor who was working on her renovation project. He was seven years younger than her and a pretty rough guy. He too was going through a divorce at the time. So let's take a quick break for our sponsors, and then we'll learn about the third main character in this crime, Danny Pelosi. Danny Pelosi was born to a banker and Korean War veteran in Flushing, Queens. He was the fourth of six siblings. When he was 11, his parents, Janet and Bob, moved the family to a safer neighborhood in Long Island. Because of being bullied in school, Danny was taught to protect himself. But he thought of himself as a tough guy, and he tended to overdo it in schoolyard fights. So Danny's father signed him up for boxing lessons. And he was good at this. He took hits, and he didn't quit. But he also got into some trouble for petty crimes in his teenage years, mostly shoplifting beer and cigarettes. When he turned 17, his parents divorced. They had been having marital problems for some time. His father remarried a colleague at his bank, and Danny was pissed off about this. Yeah, he ended up with quite a chip on his shoulder. In 1982, Danny's girlfriend Tammy got pregnant, and they got married, and Danny got a tattoo of a heart with Tammy's name written in the middle of it on his left bicep. Danny started working at a local gas station, and they lived in her parents' cellar. But within a year, Danny lost his job and he was arrested, this time for unauthorized use of a vehicle. His father bailed him out as he had before, and that summer he went to work on a commercial construction site. But he had a serious injury. So he had a back injury and a concussion from like a ceiling falling on him. And he was given meds for the pain, but he became addicted, really using an excess of the pills along with large amounts of alcohol. So Danny and Tammy had to go on welfare for a while. Then Danny was arrested again for DUI and had his driver's license suspended. His arrest record, of course, made it tough to get a job. And after another DUI arrest, Danny's dad put him in rehab. But he was kicked out for being disruptive and disobedient, so that didn't work. No, he went on to get into trouble more and more with the law, from everything from assault to burglary. Uh, He and Tammy still had sex, and they had two more kids. They had trouble paying their bills. They fought a lot. And even when he was sober, he cheated on Tammy. Danny had a civil suit pending for years that was related to his work injury because he tended to blame all his problems and misfortunes on the injury. When the civil case did finally go to court, Danny was awarded zero, nothing. And this was a big disappointment because he had this idea that once he got that settlement, he'd be rich. But he did get off the drugs and alcohol and managed to stay off until April of 98. Then he was arrested for a DUI again. He got six months in jail and five years probation. And Tammy had had enough. She filed for divorce. Danny then had this fantasy that he would be supported by a rich woman. He saw himself as a real ladies' man, and he told friends that he would find a gorgeous rich woman to take care of him. Ta-da! And there she is. Generosa. Yeah. Now, when Ted learned that Generosa had a new boyfriend, at first he was thrilled. Take some pressure off him, give her someone else to control. Yeah. (laughs) But after Danny moved in with Generosa and the children, she became even more irrational. So Ted hired a private investigator to look into Danny's history, and what he found wasn't real great. Wasn't encouraging at all. Danny had multiple arrests for drunk driving and assault. He had a revoked driver's license. And he'd even done jail time. Yeah, and on top of being upset about Generosa's choice of a partner, he was pretty stunned when he got the monthly bills from the Stanhope Hotel. Generosa was spending in excess of $100,000 per month there. She'd taken a suite for her and Danny, another room for the two kids, and then she'd take other rooms for the au pair, assistants, and some of Danny's relatives would come and go. 
So Ted told Generosa, you know, I need to see an accounting of these expenses. They're pretty out of control. And he also wanted to see the contractor plans for the townhouse because that was costing a lot. And when she refused, he cut off her funds so that she and Danny had to leave the Stanhope. And that didn't go over well with her. He also cut off the funds for the special corporation that he had set up for the townhouse's renovation project. This corporation was being run by Danny Pelosi, and he'd made many non-related purchases that had nothing to do with the renovation, including buying himself a brand new Ford Explorer. So pretty outrageous. Well, we're making good use of Ted's money. Absolutely. Now, Generosa told family and friends that they had to choose sides. She talked badly about Ted to the kids, trying to turn them against him. And this worked. They became estranged from Ted. So Generosa, Danny, and the children moved to the Hampton Place for the summer. Ted agreed that she would have sole use of it while the attorneys worked out the finances. Ted got his own place in the Hamptons to visit the kids. And a judge mandated a temporary custody arrangement while a permanent arrangement was being determined. So Generosa, she hired an armed bodyguard for $50,000 a year. And then she had a butler and a cook who were paid $100,000 a year. In the divorce settlement, she wanted $180,000 a month just for basic living expenses. She also wanted the English estate, the Hampton House, the London apartment, and the new townhouse in Manhattan. She had her nanny or her personal assistant taking care of the kids pretty much, signing all their school papers and even attending parent-teacher conferences. And then she went through manic periods and periods of deep depression, but continued to refuse treatment. Yeah, and these twins were just completely pulled into the divorce and custody battle. And they were obligated to tell their mother repeatedly that they were on her side completely. Generosa encouraged them to read the divorce papers, and she took them with her for meetings with her lawyer. She also told the kids that Ted was going to have her killed and kidnap them. So well, they, that's an encouraging thing for a this, kid to hear. This is not great for these poor kids. No. No no wonder that they were pretty emotionally spent from this entire situation. But Generosa refused to take them to therapy. When a family court judge ordered her to get help for her children, she delayed it and then put it off indefinitely. Yeah, I mean, she pretty much said she was just too busy to do that. But this is a woman without a job, no financial concerns. I mean, most of us just can't relate to the ridiculousness of this. No, it's tough. Yeah. And then she reneged on an agreement for joint custody, and she filed for sole custody. In the meantime, she didn't follow the temporary agreement for Ted to spend time with the children. When Ted expected them, she might just not bring them. And then sometimes when he wasn't expecting them, she'd drop them off with his doorman or his secretary and say, here you go. So obviously she has a lot of anger against him. (laughs) Sure does. (laughs) So in the fall of 2001, final papers for the divorce were being put together, but had not been signed. There did appear, though, to be a light at the end of the tunnel. The lawyers had managed to convince Generosa that Ted was actually worth less than she believed, and she agreed to take 20 to $25 million as her total share. Yeah, so I guess he'd been worth like $100 million, and it had gone down quite a bit in the 90s after the big boom. And also, she'd spent a shit ton. Now, Generosa would get the Manhattan townhouse, but the other homes were going to be sold. Her demands for full custody had been rejected by the court, and custody would be shared equally. Generosa wasn't happy about this, but according to her attorney, she was resigned to that fact. But despite all the trauma, friends would say that Ted seemed happier in the fall of 2001 than he really had in a long time. He'd realized that having more and more money wouldn't buy him happiness. And he'd actually donated $15 million to his alma mater, Bucknell. On October 20th, a Saturday, Ted drove himself to East Hampton for some relaxation. He liked to visit alone on the weekends sometimes just to clear his mind. In a few days, he planned to sign his divorce papers and put this whole ugly mess behind him. This was a warm day, almost as if summer hadn't ended, except that the trees had yellow and red leaves. It's the only way you could tell that it was October. He carried his groceries inside after punching in the burglar alarm code, and then he let his three dogs out to run free on the property. So his girlfriend, or mistress, whatever you want to call her, came by that afternoon, and she and Ted had sex. 
She left that night, though, because she had a boyfriend back in New York who didn't know that she was seeing Ted. So they were both cheating. She and, and that evening, Ted went to dinner alone at a local restaurant. Then he went for a walk on the beach. And while he was walking on the sand, he had called Mary and left a voicemail. He told her he was on Two Mile Hollow Beach, which was known as a gay beach where men would pick each other up. So he said he was afraid of some men there, and he was going back home. But according to Mary, this was just Ted making a joke. Ted didn't lock his doors before he went up to bed, and he went to bed naked, as he always did. He was alone in the house with just the three dogs. Now, one thing we know is that at 2 a.m., someone logged on to the security camera system with a laptop computer, and this allowed them to see what was happening inside of the house. After 21 minutes of watching the house, the person logged off. So Middle Lane, where the Amon house was, had no street lights. So once the house lights were turned off, it was super dark. You might have a little light from the stars and the moon. That's it. And so Mary listened to Ted's voicemail message Sunday morning. She called, but couldn't reach him on the house phone or on his cell phone. So Sunday afternoon, she and a friend of hers drove out there and walked by the house. They saw his car, but nothing else was going on there. She called the house phone again, got no answer, and went back home. That afternoon, a man driving down Ted's street noticed two suspicious-looking men, one who was in camouflage clothing, and they were walking down Ted's driveway. Danny Pelosi went to Tammy's house Sunday morning for his son's birthday, and at 2 p.m. he was at a family wedding. That night, he went back to Generosa's townhouse in the city, and Generosa would later claim that she and Danny had been there all weekend. Ted's house and cell phones actually rang several times on Sunday. Both his sister Sandy and his business partner, Mark Angelson, called repeatedly and got no answer. Mark Angelson was concerned when Ted didn't return from the Hamptons on Monday morning. He missed a meeting that morning that he had arranged and was looking forward to. So Mark called Sandy, who lived in Alabama, but she had also been trying to reach Ted without success. Ted's assistant also called him in Manhattan, in Hampton, and on his cell phone. He also had this special internet beeper to send and receive emails with her, but he was totally unreachable. So then I guess the final straw was when Mark learned that Ted hadn't shown to pick up his children from school. That made him really worried. He was so worried that he got a helicopter and he flew from Manhattan to East Hampton to check on his friend. So after landing in the Hamptons, Mark got a cab to pick him up at the heliport and drive him to Ted's house. As he pulled into the long gravel driveway, he saw Ted's silver Porsche parked in front of the house. So Ted hadn't driven anywhere. Mark thought either Ted was off on a walk or he was dead. He parked behind the Porsche and went to the front door, which he knew Ted usually left unlocked. Because he was already concerned that someone had killed his friend, he put on gloves before opening the door. The door was unlocked as Mark let himself in, and he called out Ted's name. No reply. As he walked in further, he saw blood at the foot of the wide central staircase. He followed a trail of blood up the stairs to the master bedroom, where he found Ted's nude, lifeless body on the bed. His head was obviously bludgeoned. Ted's three friendly dogs, two Goldens and a chocolate lab, were downstairs, looking nervous and confused. So it was 5.19 that Monday when Mark Angelson called the East Hampton Village Police, and he told the operator he was reporting a murder. Ted's murder was actually the first in East Hampton since 1982, and the previous murder had been a drunken bar fight, which led to a fatal stabbing, so it was pretty open and shut. The only other murder in the residents' memories had occurred 10 years before that one. This time, a reclusive theater set designer had died in an arson fire. But that case wasn't proven to be a murder. Investigators believed it could have been a suicide, and the fire could have actually have been set by the victim himself. So anyway, the East Hampton Village Police are not experienced in murder investigations. They called in the Suffolk County Homicide Squad, and they roped off the entire block. Officers were posted outside of the house as they waited for the homicide squad to arrive and take over. All of the doors of the house were found unlocked. The burglar alarm had been shut off prior to the murder. 
Pending autopsy results, Ted's cause of death was repeated blunt force trauma to the head. He had defensive wounds to his hands and arms as well as cuts. The killer would have been covered in blood. The rug and the wall beside the bed were soaked with blood. There was also that trail of drips of blood on the stairs, to the base of the stairs, and even some on the living room rug. Then they even found a few drops on the rear patio, which led investigators to wonder if the killer had exited through the rear of the house. Ted's body was room temperature, so this meant that he had probably been dead for an extended period of time. No murder weapon was found, but the black wrought iron stand beside the fireplace was missing all of the tools. So it's possible that one or more of these tools were the murder weapon. Right, the blow pope. <laughs> the police also considered the possibility that there was more than one killer. So the first canvassing of the neighborhood brought forth no witnesses. No one had seen anything or heard anything that whole weekend. No one had even heard the dogs barking. Well, you know, those goldens are sweet, but no one ever called them good guard dogs. No, they just as soon lick your hand and face. Exactly. Although we did have one golden who could be vicious. Yeah, mostly to other dogs. That's true. He liked people. He did like people. So the only recent criminal events in the area had been a series of indecent exposures by a man the locals called the Wyborg Wanker. <laughs> he had been seen near Wyborg Beach flashing women, masturbating and running away. He had been seen Friday morning around the corner from Ted's home. This was something suspicious, but pretty unlikely that a flasher was responsible for the murder. Right. Crime scene experts collected evidence and dusted for fingerprints. And later, tests would show that there was a blood sample that did not belong to Ted, as well as several sets of unidentified fingerprints. By Tuesday, the house was swarming with TV crews and reporters. Middle Lane, where the house was, was in one of the wealthiest areas of the Hamptons. Neighbors included Jerry Seinfeld, and an exclusive golf course was less than a mile away. So this just wasn't a place where murders happened. The press release on Tuesday morning really gave up very little information, but police did ask for the public's help to report anything suspicious they may have seen that weekend in the area. Then at 11 a.m. Tuesday, Danny Pelosi was told about Ted's death by a Hampton contractor he knew. Danny asked the contractor how Ted had died, but he didn't know. Lots of rumors, though. One rumor was that Ted had overdosed. Other rumors were that it had been a crime of passion committed by someone who had been having sex with Ted. Otherwise, how could a stranger enter the house without setting off the alarm or without the dogs barking? Then there was the rumor that Ted had been a closeted homosexual who had taken someone rough home and had been robbed and murdered. Two Mile Beach was known as a place where men looked for other men to have sex with. But to the people who knew Ted, the homosexual story just didn't seem believable. He just had always seemed to be very into women and had never shown any interest in men sexually. Didn't mean it was impossible, but it seemed very unlikely. A naked man had been reported seen running down the road nearby, but remember that had been on Friday. That was before Ted even arrived there. And the naked man was believed to be the guy who had been exposing himself. The Wyborg wanker. That's his name. <laughs> so at 2 p.m. on Tuesday, detectives showed up at Jenna Rosa's Manhattan apartment, and Danny was living there with her. Danny told the police that they couldn't talk to Jenna Rosa because she didn't know yet that Ted was dead. Also, he said Jenna Rosa's divorce attorney had told him to get criminal lawyers before either of them spoke with the police. Now, I believe in getting a lawyer, but that seems a little quick. This is really preemptive, isn't it? Yeah. So by later that day, Jenna Rosa clearly knew that Ted was dead. She picked up the children, who were at Ted's apartment with his housekeeper, and told them that their father had taken too much medicine and drank too much over the weekend and that he had died at the Hampton house. Now, of course, the kids cried. Jenna Rosa, though, didn't appear to be very upset. And when it became public knowledge that Ted had been murdered, she told the kids, maybe one of your father's boyfriends killed him. Yeah, she's really kind of a snot bag. Just a great wife and mother. So, you know, investigators really couldn't immediately rule out that Ted hadn't been killed by a burglar, even though nothing appeared to be missing. When they learned about the rapid eye security system in the house, they contacted the burglar alarm contractor to help them out in the investigation. So rapid eye was this secret video surveillance system, 
and each camera ran on a 90-day loop, so someone could watch the interior of the home remotely at any time. The system was actually hidden behind a wall in the safe room, and it worked off of Ted's fax line. So when detectives went to find it in the safe room, they found the entire video system had been ripped out and was just gone. So of course it was likely that Ted's killer had known about this system and had taken it on the night of the murder, which kind of whittles the suspects down to someone that was working on the house or someone that lived there or, you know, a close friend. Someone had to know about it. Yeah, you're not just going to stumble on that. Right. So in addition to the contractor and the workman who installed the system, Danny Pelosi knew about the system. Generosa and her lawyers also knew about it because she had been using it to try and get dirt on Ted to help out with the divorce for a while now. Generosa's divorce lawyer refused to speak with the police about the divorce negotiations. She and Danny hired Manhattan lawyer Mike Shaw, and he released a statement saying that Generosa denied any involvement in Ted's murder. Generosa then fired Shaw after he made the mistake of saying the house was in West Hampton, not East Hampton. Generosa said that West Hampton was not really part of the Hamptons at all. That was more for middle-class people and beach bums, she said. It was a place where she wouldn't be caught dead. So he was fired. Oh, how dare he. Yeah, and then after that, she was represented by his associate, Michael Dowd and she paid for another attorney named Paul Bergman to represent Danny. Yeah, now although the police investigated pretty much anyone who had anything to do with Ted in his entire adult life, they kept coming back to his angry wife and her boyfriend. They had a lot of money, so it's possible they could have hired a hitman. Danny had a lengthy criminal history and may have been familiar with people who would kill for money. Yeah, now this is really annoying. Generosa had Ted's dogs sent to the local animal shelter. Didn't even let the kids have them. Fortunately, a police officer adopted one of them, and the other two were adopted quickly to two families. I mean, these were nice dogs. Sweet, well-trained. And these new owners were thrilled to have them. But it was sad for the kids, who weren't given the option by their mother to keep them. They just lost their father. It might have been some comfort to them to keep those dogs. It could have been. Just, you know, it seems very selfish, like the kids weren't being thought of at all. Well, no, they're not, but they probably have never been. So Ted's 1999 Audi was dropped off at a Manhattan auto body shop with the keys left in a night drop box. Car had been dropped there by Danny Pelosi's nephew. The shop manager was informed that Danny wanted the car detailed inside and out. So this would include cleaning, vacuuming, shampooing, and a chemical treatment on the interior surfaces. Then the following week, Danny had another of Ted's cars detailed. Danny had also given a taser stun gun to his wife, Tammy. He called his younger brother, Jim, who was a policeman, and asked if it was a violation of his probation to own a taser. Well, of course it was, and Jim said that he would get rid of it for Danny by dropping it in the drop box at the police station. So in case you don't know, the drop box is a metal tube at police precincts where anyone who has an illegal weapon can drop a gun inside and no questions are asked. After these weapons are checked to see if they're associated with any crimes, they're melted down. Then after about a week, the police were finished processing Ted's house, and Generosa hired a cleaning company and had the rugs replaced. On November 6th, Danny was approached by a reporter, and he was asked if he was involved in Ted's murder. He said to the reporter, call my lawyer, which wasn't the best answer. Then he made a deal with the reporters If they wouldn't take pictures of the children or Generosa, he would meet them at a convenience store and allow them to take his picture. So the journalists agreed and waited for Danny outside of that store. But when Danny arrived, he suddenly turned away and sped off, and a reporter was able to get the license plate number from this vehicle, and they learned that the car was still registered in Ted's name. So the next day, that paper ran the headline, Latest sleigh twist, other man drives dead mogul's car. So that looked pretty trashy. It does, doesn't it? It's not good. So on November 14th, Ted's will was read. In the will, he left nearly his entire fortune to Generosa. She received all his financial assets, with the exception of a $675,000 tax-exempt gift for his kids. The will was dated back in August 1995. 
Now, throughout the entire divorce proceedings, Ted hadn't rewritten his will. Now, this seemed like a pretty odd thing for someone with Ted's financial knowledge to overlook. It does. I guess he was just waiting for the divorce and then he was going to do it. But it's kind of weird that he didn't think to do it sooner. And nobody was worried that it was a forgery or something? No, because this was an old will. You know, back early in their marriage it had been written. Okay. So on January 10th of 2002, one day after Danny's divorce from Tammy was finalized, he and Jenna Rosa got married in Queens. Afterwards, they flew with the children to her English estate. They had moved there to get away from the publicity, according to Danny, but his past just kept catching up with him. In February, he had to return to the U.S. to go to court on a September 2001 DUI charge. He was ordered to surrender his passport, and at the arraignment, his psychiatric evaluations were read, and they showed little promise for criminal rehabilitation. He was released on $25,000 bail, but he did remain the primary suspect in Ted Amon's murder. Then Generosa returned to the U.S. with the twins so that they could be with Danny and his children, and in the spring of 2002, she was actually living with Danny in a pretty modest home in his hometown on Long Island. Back before Generosa had met Danny, back when she and Ted were still relatively happy, she had felt a lump in her left breast. Now, recall that her mother died of metastatic breast cancer, so this must have been pretty terrifying for her. Now, her doctor had ordered a mammogram, but she refused any follow-up. The doctor spoke with Ted about his concerns that the lump was malignant. But when he tried to discuss it with Generosa, she went ballistic. She would not discuss it, but she told Ted that she would see another doctor. However, there's absolutely no evidence she ever did get any follow-up medical care. So in June 2002, she became ill with chest congestion and fever. Danny took her to the doctor, and x-rays showed shadows in her breasts, lungs, and kidneys. So the cancer had spread throughout her chest and abdomen. Her lymph system had been invaded, and the cancer was in her brain as well. She's 46 years old. Pretty sad. Although, I don't know why someone wouldn't get treatment or seek out some kind of... Boy, I tell you. Yeah, pretty weird. Particularly, I mean, if she's that worried because of her family history, you'd think she'd follow up. Well, yeah, even before feeling a lump, right? Yeah. Yeah. Her grandmother also had died of cancer, so there was definitely a strong history. So, of course, this cancer was not curable. Not at this stage. No. But she could have some radiation and chemotherapy that would extend her life. But she was still very resistant to that. She told Danny and her children that Ted had conspired to keep her illness from her so that she would die, so it was all Ted's fault. Yeah, but she finally did agree to get chemo. And she also made up a new will. And in this will, she left everything to Danny and excluded the kids from the will. Right. Amazing. When Danny learned about the new will, he told her that it just wasn't right not to take care of her kids. And also, he thought they would give the police a motive for Ted's murder. So Generosa went back to her lawyer and changed the will again. This time, she left one-third of her estate to Danny and two-thirds to her kids. Yes, so in July, Generosa and the children moved back to the house in Hampton where Ted had been murdered. Their British nanny, Catherine Maine, who went by Kay, was designated as their guardian. And she had been hired originally as a housekeeper back in 1999, But she and Generosa had become pretty close. She was kind of like a mother to Generosa. Danny spent time with the children, and he also took care of Generosa. But then he had to spend more time working on preparations to defend himself against a potential murder charge for Ted Amon, because that was pretty much becoming inevitable. So it's looking more and more like he's going to get charged. Yes. So Kay took over more responsibilities in helping Generosa and the kids. Generosa was often confused, partly from the cancer that had spread and partly from the large amounts of pain medication and alcohol she was consuming. And Danny had to serve time in jail for DUI charges and for a larceny charge that he got for rewiring his house in order to steal power from the electric company. So once Danny and Generosa weren't living together, Generosa relied more and more on Kay. And she decided that her children should get most of her money and she didn't want to leave money to Danny anymore. So she had a new will drawn up, and that didn't mention Danny. 
Her lawyer has also told her that she shouldn't leave a convict to take care of her kids. And also Danny had been asking her for money, and he had bought cars with her money for at least two of his relatives. He went to Las Vegas for a long weekend, and Generosa heard from a friend that he was seen with another woman. So she's getting abandoned again. Yes, but her illness and the pressure from Ted's murder investigation, of course, took a toll on that relationship, and they were the prime suspects. Generosa did love Danny, but she said she couldn't live with him. He was just, you know, not honest, and there were a lot of problems. So she spent her final weeks in the East Hampton house with Kay and with her children. And she became very isolated. She and Danny eventually were estranged. She had found out that he also gambled away a lot of her money, and she didn't trust him with the children anymore. So when Ted's sister Sandy offered to take care of the twins, Generosa said no way. So she chose Kay to take custody of her children after her death. But the problem was the kids didn't really like Kay. When they learned that she would be their full-time guardian, they were upset about it. I guess she was pretty tough on them, like when they had a bad grade or they misbehaved, she'd make them do chores around the house and take away their TV and their computers. Also, the children felt like they could never talk to their mother without Kay being there, kind of hovering around and controlling things. But Generosa wanted Kay to have the children, but she also wanted the money to be controlled by her attorney, so she arranged for that. Sandy tried to contact Grego, who went by Greg now, so Greg, and Alexa, for two years after Ted's murder. She sent them birthday and Christmas gifts, but Generosa sent them all back. So as far as the children knew, their Aunt Sandy and Uncle Bob didn't care about them. Sandy had an attorney, and she was trying to have the children come live with her after Generosa's death. So they were able to get the children's passports seized and held to prevent Kay from taking them back to England, at least. And Generosa died in the hospital on August 22, 2003. She was 47 years old. Danny heard about her death from Generosa's attorney. Now, he believed that Kay had assisted her to kill herself. He went to the funeral home and viewed her body. He was upset because there was no autopsy to document the amount of drugs in her system. He was certain Kay wanted her dead before she could change her will again. Well, Danny and Kay did not get along, and he really thought that Kay just wanted Generosa to die. Plus, he was mad that Kay was going to get the kids and the money, I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. So Danny went out to the funeral home, and claimed Generosa's ashes. And he took them with him to the Stanhope Hotel and had a drink at the bar with her ashes. And this was something she had asked him to do before she died, apparently. But he ordered a beer and a Cosmopolitan, and he sat there with the box of ashes. Now they're in a cardboard box. So in some kind of effort to show respect, he draped a white napkin over the box. Well, I think that's very respectful. Right. <laughs> But Generosa's lawyer was pretty angry when he heard what Danny had done. According to Danny, he was just following his wife's final wishes. But then a picture of Danny at the bar with her ashes ended up in the newspaper. It looked pretty bad. The headline read, Pelosi toasts ashes of wife in a bar where they met. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, if that's what she wanted, I say sure. whatever. It is a little weird. Especially considering the circumstances. I guess, right? Yeah. So the court made Kay the permanent guardian of the Ammon twins. She didn't allow them to go to the memorial service that had been arranged by Danny and his family. Greg was sent away to boarding school, and Alexa remained in East Hampton with Kay and went to an exclusive private school. The kids wrote a letter to the judge in the custody case saying that they disliked Kay and did not want to live in the house where their father had been killed. So there was a hearing to determine whether Kay would maintain custody or whether Sandy and Bob Williams would become the children's guardians. Generosa had left nothing to Danny. She set up a life estate for Kay, which gave her the right to live in the Hampton house for the rest of her life. Both of the kids said that they would rather live with Danny Pelosi. Yeah, that's the funny thing, is they really liked Danny a lot. He was good with the kids. And that seems kind of like who Danny was. He could be quite charming, and kids liked him. But he was kind of a scumbag on the other end of things, and probably not above killing Ted the way I see it. Yes, you're right there. So Generosa's estate totaled $35 million. Danny had gotten $2 million in Ted's money, 
which he was using to defend himself and his friends as suspects in Ted's murder, which is very strange. He had also hired attorneys for a lawsuit to overturn a postnuptial agreement and Generosa's final will. So as a result, Kay didn't get her $1 million, at least not right then. Then a grand jury was held in Ted's murder, and Kay testified that Danny had confessed to her that he did kill Ted. So as the pressure was stepping up in the media, Danny began to go on network TV shows and announce his innocence. And, you know, he came across as kind of a clown. And very cavalier about the whole situation. Well, that's not a surprise. No. So J.P. Morgan Chase filed a $20 million wrongful death suit against Danny, claiming that he had murdered Ted. This case was held in abeyance until the criminal trial could be completed. Danny claimed he was broke. He spent his whole $2 million postnuptial payment on attorney's fees. Well, I mean, just the fact that he's using money that Ted earned to defend himself for killing Ted is yeah, tough to swallow. It is. So even though Danny's claiming to be poor, he was still living the life. He found a pretty new girlfriend and took her and a whole group of friends to Hawaii in January of 2004. The day after they checked into the Maui Marriott, an 18-year-old girl fell off of a balcony in the hotel to her death. But Danny seemed unfazed by this, and he even made jokes that he might become a suspect in the girl's death. Yeah, Mr. Comedian. Right. So in March of 2004, Danny was arraigned for the second-degree murder of Ted Amon, and he was held without bail. And just before his trial began in September of 2004, the lead prosecutor, Janet Albertson, alleged that Pelosi had threatened her children, that he'd tampered with a juror, and that he had admitted to committing the crime. So the trial was delayed as they argued over these new charges of attempting to intimidate witnesses, influence a juror, criminal solicitation, and conspiracy. Danny was charged with directing his now fiance Jennifer, to deliver $500 in cash to a woman at a McDonald's as part of a payment, a down payment, to have witnesses assaulted and threatened. And Jennifer had been caught on a prosecution videotape handing over that cash. Uh Uh-oh. So then Jennifer testified against Danny at the grand jury to get immunity from this. So opening statements on the case began October 13th. The prosecutor said that Generosa's $3 million townhouse building loan was about to come due right after Ted's murder. So when Ted was killed, she was very desperate for money. The defense brought up the theory that a homosexual encounter was what actually led to Ted's murder. And the forensic evidence just wasn't clear. It didn't incriminate or exonerate Danny. Prosecution witnesses were the focus of the trial, and they held up to cross-examination quite well. Danny's father, Bob, actually testified, and he said that Danny had asked him to get rid of something on the weekend of Ted's murder. Bob hadn't asked him what it was because he didn't want to know, he said, but he had declined. But Danny had later told him that a friend of his had taken care of it for him. Then there was an old friend of Danny's who testified that about a year before Ted's murder, Danny got drunk and told him he was going to kill Ted for his money. He said he was going to leave his wife marry Generosa, and then go back to Tammy after he was rich. He said he was going to bash in Ted's brains while he was sleeping. Then one of Danny's former girlfriends testified that three days after Ted's murder, Danny came to her apartment and asked her to lie for him because Generosa was going to frame him for Ted's murder. So this old girlfriend agreed to give him a phony alibi because she was still in love with him. But when she saw that he was engaged to Generosa, she changed her mind. She said, "Uh uh-uh. She added that Danny had told her that Generosa was there at the time of the murder, as well as a friend of Danny's and his nephew Jeff, who drove the getaway car. So the defense claimed that a pubic hair belonging to someone else had been found on Ted's body, and it had mysteriously gone missing. But then a forensic scientist testified that the hair on Ted's shoulder was actually his own, growing out of his own skin. So that was a nothing. One other big witness for the prosecution was Kay the nanny, She testified that Danny had come home drunk one night and he had confessed to the murder, telling her how Ted had begged for his life and how he had beaten him over and over. So according to Kay, Danny also threatened her life. 
Then there were jailhouse snitches who testified against Danny. Just as the case was wrapping up, Danny decided to testify in his own defense. This was kind of a shocker, but he seemed very confident. His lawyers were not confident. His attorney asked him just a few questions, and Danny denied being the murderer and denied being in East Hampton, but then when cross-examination came about, he did not hold up well at all. He tried to turn on the charm, even telling a few jokes as he testified, and none of the jurors were amused. Most of them had looks of distaste and disgust on their faces. He admitted that Generosa had asked him to kill Ted, but he said that he had refused. So that was a bad decision. Well, usually it is. Usually, yeah. Well, in closing, the prosecutor tore apart the defense's claim that all of the witnesses had conspired to frame Danny. After the jurors began their deliberations, they asked that Danny's cross-examination be read back to them, and then the day after that, they came back with their verdict. So it was December 13, 2004, when Danny Pelosi was found guilty of murdering Ted Amon, and he was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. That same year, Ted Amon's sister, Sandra Williams, was awarded custody of the twins. The twins went to visit Sandy and Bob Williams and just loved them. They thought, wow, you know, a house can be like this because these were, you know, normal, happy people. Gave them a nice, stable life in a reasonable house. None of this craziness. And the kids loved it and actually ended up being very happy with Sandy and Bob. So it was nice that they got to stay in the family. Yeah, well, and it's nice that they had competent parents. Yeah, right. I mean, Sandy had had children. She was also a grandmother. And she said to the New York Magazine at the time, the point is that we can provide the most loving, stable home for them, no question. And it's absolutely what their father would have wanted. And Danny Pelosi's friend and former employee, Christopher Perino, pled guilty to one count of hindering the prosecution and one count of criminal facilitation for his part in Ted Ammon's murder. Yeah, so I guess he had been along with the nephew Jeff and in the car, but apparently didn't know anything about a murder happening, at least not beforehand. Right. At his own sentencing hearing in 2006, Perino testified that he drove with Danny to Ted Ammon's home on the night of the murder. He said that Danny planned to confront Ted about the divorce. He also claimed he saw Danny run from the East Hampton home that night with blood on his clothes, saying he had gotten into a fight with Ted, and he thought Ted was dead. Now, Perino was sentenced to just six months in jail. Which is, you know, pretty crummy. You know, who are these people that participate in a murder and only get a few months? It's just like that woman in the Kelsey Barrett case, that crystal. Yeah, was there some plea deal worked out? But the most she could get is a very short amount of time. Yeah, what about this guy? Six months. Oh, did he work out a deal with the police for testifying or something? Well, yeah, I'm sure he did, because he did testify. So seven years after Danny Pelosi was convicted of murdering Ted, Greg Amon, Ted's son, produced a documentary which he titled 59 Middle Lane. And this is basically about the kids going back to the Hamptons and back to the Ukraine and finding their family from the Ukraine. And they talk a little bit about Danny and missing their father. And it's kind of an interesting documentary. Danny has appealed his conviction and has claimed that his wife, Generosa, and former employee, Christopher Perino, are the ones who were really responsible for the murder. But Perino denies any involvement in the murder, and he says that Pelosi has ruined his life. So, fascinating case. Very. So many twists and turns to it. The references for this case are 48 Hours. They have two episodes about the case. There's also an episode of Crime Watch Daily. There's a book about the case titled Almost Paradise by Kieran Crowley. And then, of course, the documentary that Greg Amon made that was made eight years after his mother's death. So TCB's music was written and produced by Tristan Capel. So thank you, Tristan. If you haven't joined Team Tie Grabber, it's okay. I understand. But if you ever decide that you're interested, we do have some good stuff coming up. Can you tell our members a little bit about our extra episode for members in February? Ah, uh, yeah. I've just started doing some research without giving away too much. It's about a cosmetic surgeon who is found guilty of negligent homicide in the death of a patient while he was performing surgery on her. Interesting story. 
because he, he never should have had a medical license. Anyway, he, <laughs> he serves his time, he gets out of jail, and he's going to be walking in a straight and narrow, except he doesn't have a medical license. He's trying to figure out what to do. Okay, so he does some unsavory things that we'll talk about. He tries to poison his wife. Yeah, you said you weren't going to give it away. So that's it. Okay. There's a lot more to it, I hope. There is. Okay. It's, it's fascinating. All right. Well, these commercial-free members-only episodes come out every month. Plus, you know, there's a backlog of about 40 episodes that are yours to listen to if you decide to become a member. You can listen to those right away. Binge them if you want. Some recent episodes worth noting are the story of Sheila, D- of Sheila Davalu, the murder of Josh Hilberling, the kidnapping of Shannon Matthews, and many, many more. There are some older ones I was thinking about that are quite good, too, like the honor killing of Jesse Sidhu and the crimes of Robert Reldon. He was supposed to be this real charming kind of Ted Bundy-ish guy who was just evil, much like Ted Bundy was. And he was a prolific rapist and murderer. Yes, terrible guy. So you could be a Tie Grabber member for as little as four bucks a month, And when you join, you have your choice of a Welcome to the Brewery gift, which we'll send to you, as always, with a nice handwritten thank you note. Just go to tiegrabber.com, click on subscribe, and you can learn more about it. Some other ways to offer your support to us are to rate us on iTunes or wherever it is that you listen. These ratings are actually quite important to helping us grow our listener base, and they're always very much appreciated. Also, consider doing some shopping on our website, tiegrabber.com. That's always a big help, and you get something nice out of it. You can really buy pretty much anything with our logo on it, and that can also help to spread the word that we do exist to other people. So we're going to move on to feedback now. If you have a case suggestion or comments about a crime or a beer, we encourage you to send us a voicemail. We have a little widget on our website that you can see on the right side of your screen, and you can just click on that and record your message. Another way to send us a voicemail is just record your message on your voice memo function on your phone and paste it into an email to us. If you're just too shy for either of those, send us an email with your comments or suggestions to truecrimebrewery at tiegrabber.com. We really do love to hear from our listeners. If you signed up for our newsletter, we did put out our first quarterly newsletter in January. So be kind, this was the first newsletter I've ever created, so it's a little bit rough around the edges. One reason I started the newsletter was to allow our listeners to submit short articles about anything in the true crime genre, and we can publish them for all of our listeners to read. So if you're a writer, or you think you have what it takes, or you just have something interesting to share, we'd love to read your submission and share it with all of the other people in our TCB community. We're also bringing back a contest we did three years ago, which was very popular. This is the beer review contest. Well, that was fun. Yeah. We're going to run this contest for at least a couple of months, I figure. And what you do is you record yourself reviewing one of your favorite brews, just as Dick does in the beginning of each of our shows. So we're going to judge these submissions on personality, detail, and overall charm of the review. And audio quality will not be judged. So don't worry if you don't have recording equipment. Just a simple voicemail or voice memo recording is great. Absolutely. And the prize for this is going to be fairly substantial because I want to give away a pair of my favorite Bluetooth earbuds to our winner so he or she can enjoy the high-quality, comfortable podcast listening that I do. So I'll give more details about this in upcoming weeks. Okay, on to feedback. I have a couple voicemails, and I don't know, two or three emails. So the first voicemail is from Rob. He has some comments that he wanted to make. Well, hi, Dick and Joe. Uh, My name is Rob. I'm a a retired physician in Ontario, and um, this is really directed at Dick. I just want to say that I'm really impressed with your ability to express the medical viewpoint on a number of these cases. And I've listened to a lot of your podcasts, and I really find that your medical interpretations are right on the money and much, much better than most, let's say. I can completely respect what you say, and I agree with what you say for the most part. And uh, I'm really pleased that a pediatrician on podcast is able to be so rational and so logical and so much a you know, a good member of the 
profession. So my sincere congratulations to you guys for putting out a good podcast and Dick for being a very rational member of the profession. Thanks. I didn't pick that just because he was giving praise. I know. You were kind of embarrassed. But I think, you know, it's just nice to get some backup so people know that you are pretty on target. Well, it's, it's nice to hear from a fellow physician. Absolutely. And I, I think some of my ability to communicate is because early in my career, I did a lot of teaching. I taught medical students. I taught interns and residents. So I've had a lot of opportunity back in the day, as we say, for interacting with people and trying to make sure that they had a good understanding of whatever knowledge I was trying to impart to them. Well, I think that's just great, and you deserve some uh, nice feedback there. So great. You know, this is even though everything I taught kids about genetics many <laughs> years ago is false, <laughs> as, as new things have been discovered, but be that as it may. Well, you can't help that progress. I'm sure a lot of the things we believe now will be proven false as well. You bet. That's the way it works. So our next voicemail is from Jordan. Jordan has a case suggestion. Hello. My name is Jordan. I am from Simi Valley, California. I have a case suggestion for you. Um, it's the case of Elliot Roger. He was a 22-year-old who opened fire on people in Santa Barbara. He attended uh, SBC back in 2014, and uh, he was a very lonely and shy kid, and um, he grew up in wealth. His father was a second unit director for the first Hunger Games movie, and he felt that he was privileged to everything in life, and when he didn't get what he wanted, he would throw tantrums, and eventually he threw a big temper tantrum on May 23rd, 2014, by going on a mass shooting in Santa Barbara, killing uh, six people. The case was very interesting to me because uh, it happened pretty close to me, and the thing is is that I had a friend, I had a friend who was friends with his sister, Georgia, and said that he was a very reclusive shy kid and yeah i do have a beer suggestion i don't really drink beer i'm more of a scotch guy myself but there's a popular beer where uh, near where i live it's called 805 it's like a i think it's a dark beer i believe my friend uh who lives in camarillo is a huge fan of it so uh that's my beer suggestion and uh again the case is uh about elliot roger he was a 22 year old he uh committed suicide after committing the massacre it's one of the most least talked about school shootings in u.s history because the body count was so low but his presence his his uh, whole uh presence was was felt because you know he left behind a uh 141 page manifesto you can find it online it's called my twisted world if you look if you just type in my twisted world to google you will find uh, a pdf of his manifesto and it's 141 pages going from his childhood all the way to to uh, his adulthood where it starts off nice, and then he ends up becoming a deranged killer, and eventually in between that, he becomes a recluse, he gets addicted to video games, and he pretty much isolates himself, but he blames other people for his social isolation, which makes him a non-sympathetic character, and the fact that he killed six people also makes it that, too. So, uh, yeah, those are my suggestions. I uh, hope you have a great day. Bye. So, I, we've heard of this case, and I don't know if it's been suggested by someone else before, or we just remember the kind of the details, because it's not that long ago, five or six years ago. He went on this killing spree in 2014. First, he stabbed his two college roommates to death in their apartment and also killed a friend of theirs who was visiting. Then he hung out for a few hours, then drove to a sorority house because he, he was planning on killing all the sorority girls in the house. I do remember this, and this was a terrifying thing for parents especially, yeah. huh? Well, parents and students. Exactly. But he never he couldn't enter the sorority. So he hung outside. He shot three women outside the house and killed two of them. Then he drove to a deli in town and shot and killed just a random person. Then he drove throughout the town shooting at random people. Finally, he crashed into a parked car and killed himself. While he was driving throughout the town, he didn't kill any, uh, any other people, any further people. Six is the body count, as Jordan said. And I think it would definitely be interesting, not just doing this case, but I'd love to read his manifesto. Well, I mean, this is like the story of a school shooter, pretty much. So it's a whole kind of psychological problem and personality in a lot of these cases. You're right. Yeah. Okay, so I think it might be worth talking about. So thank you very much, Jordan. What about the beer? 
The beer, 805, is a nice beer. Uh, Firestone Walker Brewing Company does it. I'm not sure. In fact, I don't think I've ever had any of 805, but I've had a ton of Firestone Walker beers. They, they do nice beers. Okay. So so might I'll, be a good beer to put in an episode. I'll look for that. Okay. Yeah, if, I think if we do this episode, I would definitely do 805 as the beer. Okay, great. So I have a YouTube case suggestion from Bobby and Rhonda. And this message is, please review the case of Dr. Dirk Greinader. I'm a true crime aficionado, and this crime was riveting. He had it all, but threw it away in order to free himself for a life of shocking lust and depravity. May Greinader was beaten and nearly decapitated while walking with her husband in a park in 1999. Her husband, a renowned allergist, was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison in 2011. So the motive was that May had discovered her husband was having sex with prostitutes and that he was addicted to internet pornography. And he was a cross-dresser. Okay, so he had a lot of secrets. She knew about them. And he killed her and said that it was done by a random person, I guess? Yeah, he said that she twisted her ankle or something, so he walked on ahead. He told her to stay there. I'll go ahead and get some help. And then snuck back and killed her. Wow. Okay. Yeah, this was in broad daylight. This is pretty ballsy. That is. It's horrific. So, yeah, definitely. That's a that's a good suggestion, I think. That could have a lot to talk about with that case. Yeah. We could. He was at uh, Harvard Medical School. He worked at Brigham and Women's Children's Hospital. He, he was a big deal. That's amazing. So we have a case suggestion from Kay. We do. So Kay says, I love the show. I have a case I'd love to hear your opinion on. It's a bit different than most of the cases you've done, but I think it's very interesting. It also touches on some hot-button issues. In short, a college student had a physical altercation with a group of other college students. Uh, Nobody was really badly injured. He walked across a large parking lot to his car where he retrieved his gun. He then returned to the group of students and shot them. One died, several were injured, and one witness later killed himself. Now, the question at trial was self-defense or murder. Thanks for the consideration. As in any good college town, there are lots of breweries in Flagstaff. Oh, sure. I'm sure you're familiar with some of those. I think so. I mean, this kid was in attendance at, I think it's Northern Arizona University, something like that. He was a freshman when this happened. Yeah, this sounds familiar to me, too. I think I heard about that on the news. Yeah, this isn't too too old either. So thank you. That's a great suggestion, Kay. Yes, so. I think we'll, we'll look into that one i got to see how much info I can get. Okay, sounds good. Well, thank you everyone for listening. We really appreciate it. And we'll see you next time at The Quiet End. We'll be waiting for you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye.